Good afternoon and welcome to our press conference. We are joined here on stage today by ECB President Lagarde and by ECB Vice President De Guindos. My name is Wolfgang Preussel. May I kindly ask those journalists who are going to ask a question uh, to turn on their camera so we can see their faces. I will now give the floor to President Lagarde. President Lagarde, please. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, and good afternoon. Uh, the Vice President and I welcome you to our press conference. The rebound phase in the recovery of the euro area economy is increasingly advanced. Output is expected to exceed its pre-pandemic level by the end of this year. With more than 70% of European adults fully vaccinated, the economy has largely reopened, allowing consumers to spend more and companies to increase production. While rising immunity to the coronavirus means that the impact of the pandemic is now less severe, the global spread of the Delta variant could yet delay the full reopening of the economy. The current increase in inflation is expected to be largely temporary and underlying price pressures are building up only slowly. The inflation outlook in our new staff projections has been revised slightly upwards, but in the medium term, inflation is foreseen to remain well below our 2% target. Financing conditions for firms, households, and the public sector have remained favorable since our previous quarterly assessment in June. Favorable finan financing conditions are essential for the economy to continue its recovery and to offset the negative impact of the pandemic on inflation. Based on a joint assessment of financing conditions and the inflation outlook, the Governing Council judges that favorable financing conditions can be maintained with a moderately lower pace of net asset purchases under the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Programme than in the previous two quarters. We also confirmed our other measures, namely the level of the key ECB interest rates, our forward guidance on their likely future evolution, our purchases under the Asset Purchase Programme, our reinvestment policies, and our longer-term refinancing operations, as detailed in the press release published at quarter to two today. We stand ready to adjust all of our instruments as appropriate to ensure that inflation stabilizes at our 2% target over the medium term. I will now outline in more detail how we see the economy and inflation developing, and then talk about our assessment of financial and monetary conditions. Let's turn to the economic activity. The economy rebounded by 2.2% in the second quarter of the year, which was more than expected. It is on track for strong growth in the third quarter. The recovery builds on the success of the vaccination campaigns in Europe, which have allowed a significant reopening of the economy. With the lifting of restrictions, the service sector is benefiting from people returning to shops and restaurants and from the rebound in travel and tourism. Manufacturing is performing strongly, even though production continues to be held back by shortages of materials and equipment. The spread of the Delta variant has so far not required lockdown measures to be reimposed, but it could slow the recovery in global trade and the full reopening of the economy. Consumer spending is increasing, although consumers remain somewhat cautious in the light of the pandemic developments. The labor market is also improving rapidly, which holds out the prospect of higher incomes and greater spending. 
unemployment is declining, and the number of people in job retention schemes has fallen by about 28 million from the peak last year. The recovery in domestic and global demand is further boosting optimism among firms, which is supporting business investment. At the same time, there remains some way to go before the damage to the economy caused by the pandemic is overcome. There are still more than 2 million fewer people employed than before the pandemic, especially among the younger and lower skilled. The number of workers in job retention schemes also remains substantial. To support the recovery, ambitious, targeted, and coordinated fiscal policy should continue to complement monetary policy. In particular, the next generation EU programme will help ensure a stronger and uniform recovery across Euro area countries. It will also accelerate the green and digital transition, support structural reforms and lift long-term growth. We expect the economy to rebound firmly over the medium term. Our new staff projections foresee annual real GDP growth at 5% in 21, 4.6% in 22, and 2.1% in 23. Compared with our June staff projections, the, the outlook has improved for 2021 and is broadly unchanged for 22 and 23. Inflation increased to 3% in August. We expect inflation to rise further this autumn, but to decline next year. This temporary upswing in inflation mainly reflects strong increase in oil prices since around the middle of last year, the reversal of the temporary VAT reduction in Germany, delayed summer sales in 2020, and cost pressures that stem from temporary shortages of materials and equipment. In the course of 2022, these factors should ease or will fall out of the year-on-year -year inflation calculation. Underlying inflation pressures have edged up. As the economy recovers further and supported by our monetary policy measures, we expect underlying inflation to rise over the medium term. This increase is expected to be only gradual, since it will take time for the economy to return to operating at full capacity, and therefore wages are expected to grow only moderately. Measures of longer-term inflation expectations have continued to increase, but these remain some distance from our 2% target. The new staff projections foresee annual inflation at 2.2% in 21, 1.7% in 22, and 1.5% in 23, being revised up compared with the previous projections in June. Inflation, excluding food and energy price inflation, is projected to average 1.3 in 21, 1.4 in 22 and 1.5 in 23, also being revised up from the June projections. Let's turn to the risk assessment. We see the risks to the economic outlook as broadly balanced. Economic activity could outperform and expectations if consumers become more confident and save less than currently expected. A faster improvement in the, pandemic in the pandemic situation could also lead to a stronger expansion than currently envisaged. If supply bottlenecks last longer and feed through into higher than anticipated wage rises, price pressures could be more persistent. At the same time, the economic outlook could deteriorate 
if the pandemic worsens, which could delay the further reopening of the economy, or if supply shortages turn out to be more persistent than currently expected and hold back production. So let us look at the financial and monetary conditions now. The recovery of growth and inflation still depends on favorable financing conditions for all sectors of the economy. Market interest rates have eased over the summer, but reversed recently. Overall, financing conditions for the economy remain favorable. Bank lending rates for firms and households are at historically low levels. Lending to households is holding up, especially for house purchases. The somewhat slower growth of lending to firms is mainly due to the fact that firms are still well-funded because they borrowed heavily in the first wave of the pandemic. They have high cash holdings and are increasingly retaining earnings, which reduces the need for external funding. For larger firms, issuing bonds is an attractive alternative to bank loans. Solid bank balance sheets continue to ensure that sufficient credit is available. However, many firms and households have taken on more debt during the pandemic. A deterioration of the economic outlook could threaten their financial health. This, in turn, would worsen the quality of banks' balance sheets. Policy support remains essential to prevent balance sheet strains and tightening financing conditions from reinforcing each other. In conclusion, the euro area economy is clearly rebounding. However, the speed of the recovery continues to depend on the course of the pandemic and progress with vaccinations. The current rise in inflation is expected to be largely temporary and underlying price pressures will build up only gradually. The slight improvement in the medium term inflation outlook and the current level of financing conditions allow favorable financing conditions to be maintained with a moderately lower pace of net asset purchases under the PEP. Our policy measures, including our revised forward guidance on the key ECB interest rates, are key to helping the economy shift to a sustained recovery and ultimately to bringing inflation to our 2% target. We now stand ready to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. And today the first question goes to Tom Fairless of the Wall Street Journal. Tom, please. Hi, thanks, thanks very much for taking my question. Um, yeah, I had two questions. Uh, the first was um, on the pace, on, on the discussion around reducing asset purchases. And um, some of your council members have suggested that they would like to see the program, the PEP program coming to an end soon. Would, would you characterize this um, or did you characterize this internally as a taper or is it a turning point or how would you, um, how, how would you characterize the move? Um, and the second question was around you know, why you feel confident enough to do this. Um, your 2023 outlook for inflation is uh, 1.5%, which is some way below your uh, medium term target. There also, there also seems to be a lot of uncertainty in the global economy around Delta, around slowdown in China. Um, so why did you think this was, uh, you know, reducing your stimulus was, was the correct move? Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your, for your uh, questions. Um, I would preface the, my, first re my response to your first question by a quote, actually, in a way, which is, the lady isn't tapering. Because what we are doing is recalibrating uh, PEP, which I remind you is the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program. And we are recalibrating just as we did back in December and back in March. We are doing, we're doing that on the basis of the framework, which is a joint assessment. So we look at the financing conditions and we concluded that they remain favorable and we do that on the basis on the inflation outlook. And as you rightly pointed out, 
our inflation outlook has been uh, upgraded, and uh, it has been the case for 21 significantly, 22 quite significantly, and to a lesser extent 23. But across the board, uh, you have an, uh, an improvement on the uh, inflation numbers for the whole horizon that we look at. We also look at other indicators, and on those accounts as well, there has been a significant improvement of the uh, inflation numbers, uh, both for 22 uh, and 23. So on the basis of that joint assessment, and because we know that we need to keep favorable financing conditions, this is the commitment that we have, and this is what we agreed in December, that hasn't varied. We believe that we can maintain those favorable financing conditions with a, a moderately lower pace of purchase. And of course, the choice of words is, is uh, um, relevant. Uh, it is moderately lower than what we have done in uh, Q2 and, uh, and Q3. Are we confident enough? Well, you know, the September meeting is um, conducted in the light of our projections. And what we are seeing is clearly an improvement on many fronts. Um, the output uh, numbers are much higher. Uh, the inflation number have been upgraded, as I just indicated. The employment numbers have also been uh, improved, and the unemployment situation is uh, serious, of course, but more benign than uh, was anticipated. So on the basis of all that and the success of the vaccination campaign, which we have all along said was critically important to determine the economic recovery, we believe that the euro area economy is rebounding. And uh, that gives us the confidence to take the measure that we have taken, which, as I said, is a recalibration of uh, our pandemic emergency uh, purchase program for the next three months. Thank you. The next question goes to Isabella Bufaki of Il Sole 24 Ore. Isabella, over to you, please. Hello, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. And nice to see you on Webex. Reciprocating. Um, President Lagarde, I have two questions. My first question is on financing conditions. How, uh, for how long will the ECB preserve favorable financing conditions to support the recovery also after the COVID crisis? In a sense, will favorable financing conditions end with the end of the pandemic emergency purchase program? And my second question is on PEP. As the coronavirus crisis enters a new phase, as you have described with um, the new Delta variant, but also better economic outlook and a good pace of vaccinations, can you tell us a bit more how the Governing Council intends to judge and assess the end of the COVID crisis phase, given that PEP will end when the COVID crisis phase is over? Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And it's very nice to see you as well. This is a significant improvement from previous uh, press conferences. So we're probably heading in the right direction here. Next step will be to actually see each other uh, with appropriate distance between us. On the, uh, the commitment uh, for favorable financing conditions, uh, I'll remind you that that was decided uh, at our governing council meeting in December under the auspices of PEP. So PEP is a, is this emergency program, very specifically designed for the circumstances that we have been facing, that we still face today, but that are currently clearly improving. And this commitment to the favorable financing conditions is one of the two um, parts of the joint assessment that we conduct to determine our base of purchase. So we have a framework that is very clearly designed and that operates in relation to PEP. And the day when PEP is over, uh, which presumably by then will indicate that financing conditions are favorable and that um, the economy will have recovered in such a way that the um, downward impact of the pandemic on our inflation outlook has been resolved, resorbed, at that point in time, then job is not finished because we are still 
targeting our 2%, which is now clear and straightforward uh, as, uh, as a result of our strategy review. Symmetric, 2% medium term, with a special uh, focus resulting from the, um, the lower bound. So that will continue. And the driver of our work going forward after PEP will indeed be the mandate that we have to maintain price stability as measured by our target of 2% inflation. On your um, second question, which has to do with PEP uh, in general, what we have done today uh, with the Governing Council members unanimously is to calibrate our pace of purchase in order to continue to deliver on our goal of favorable financing conditions. We have not discussed what comes next. And this is something for which we will prepare in the months to come. And I think there will be more interesting matters that will be debated in December and for which clearly you will be informed in due course. Thank you. Next question goes to Alexander Weber of Bloomberg News. Alexander, please. Alexander, can you hear us? Does not. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, please. You can hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, <clears throat> President Lagarde, some of your colleagues, including Jens Weidmann, have recently emphasized the upside risks to the inflation outlook and that the higher inflation could prove more permanent than currently. Um, could you tell us whether this view is widely shared within the Governing Council and what the discussion was like at this week's meeting? Then uh, a question on your um, on monetary stimulus. How much notice will you give markets before the PEP comes to an end? Sorry, I completely missed your second one. How much what? How much advance notice will you give markets before the PEP comes to an end? Okay. Well, thank you for the first question, because I'm going to take advantage of that one to say a few words about, about inflation and how uh, we uh, conducted our discussion on inflation. Because it is a case that in many um, countries in the euro area, uh, people are seeing uh, prices increase and they can, they can feel it. So we have to really go under the skin of inflation uh, before we actually assess whether it is temporary uh, whether it is going to last, and uh, that leads us to the conclusion of our inflation outlook, which, uh, as you know, is uh, 1.5 at the end of the uh, projection horizon. So, what do we have at the moment? We have essentially three factors that are, are, are driving prices up. Uh, the first set of factors have to do with the reopening of the economy. I mean, this is the entire dynamic. It went down massively, and prices, by the way, at the time also went, went down. The economy reopened, and from a supply point of view, from a demand point of view, of course, uh, there is pressure on, on prices. You can see that in um, what we call the base effects. A lot has to do with uh, energy prices, which constitutes a large uh, comp component of this, uh, of this base effects uh, inflation uh, uh, factor on inflation. Uh, you can see that on the uh, German VAT impact, which obviously will continue to play out until uh, the end of the year. Uh, you see that in the carbon tax that was decided also uh, in Germany. So those are the uh, base effects, um, reopening of the economy-related factors. As part of those um, reopening of the economy factors, I would distinguish uh, the, the supply bottlenecks, uh, bottlenecks um, effect. And this is something that uh, the corporates and the companies are, are, are telling us, are telling you, uh, there are bottlenecks effects, and not just in the semiconductor business, but in all sorts of sectors that are more or less affected, depending on how much they rely on those either raw materials or equipment uh, that uh, they get their supply from. And this is impacting the durable and the non-durable goods. Now, how strong will that effect be? How long will it last is something that uh, 
obviously remains to be seen. And we have put that particular item, if you uh, remember the monetary policy statement that I read for you, we have put that in the, uh, in the inflation uh, analysis where we say that if those uh, supply bottlenecks, bottlenecks last longer uh, than expected, then it, it will have uh, and an it, will, it will increase um, uh, prices and will have um, an upside pressure. But that we, we, we don't, uh, we're not certain because typically what we have seen in previous situations of that nature is that you know, when, you, when you, you have a bottleneck on your supply, well, you try to find alternatives to that supply, and as a result of that, then the supply bottleneck's impact of inflation is, is reduced and eventually goes away. Uh, in the same vein, if it's uh, bottlenecks uh, inflation that applies without too much on the demand front, it's not necessarily can be conducive to second round effect on wages in particular. So. That's the third one, the second one, which is a subset of the sort of reopening of the economy consequences. The third one, which is quite interesting as well, which is, um, especially when you disaggregate it, is the inflation that is related to services. Because we have seen a reopening of the economy on the service front uh, in the most recent month. And when you analyze where the inflation is in, those, uh, in that segment of services, you see that most of it is actually coming from what is uh, uh, subject to social distancing, which obviously has been reactivated most recently. So those are the three uh, key drivers of inflation at the moment. But as you can, you can see, many of them are of a temporary nature and will last for a period of time and will then either fall out of the period of reference or will fade out over the course of time. One component that we are addressing, monitoring and checking very um, uh, attentively is the second round effect, is the impact that price increases will have on wage negotiations. Uh, and, and, and that is uh, what could actually fuel a more persistent uh, and durable uh, price increase and, and inflation uh, going forward. On those wages front, we are not seeing much uh, by way of significant increase. Uh, we will be very attentive to the autumn negotiations that are typically taking place in some countries. But at this point in time, uh, we don't expect this wage uh, increases and these wage negotiations to be uh, very strong. And we, we see probably a gradual and, and moderate increase as a result of that. So that's what I really wanted to, um, to try to explain to you in response to your uh, question about, uh, about inflation. Now, concerning PEP, um, you know, that's a discussion that we will uh, address comprehensively at our December meeting as the term of PEP approaches. Um, we need to obviously discuss the terms and conditions of, of how that term occurs. And uh, you will hear me again on this matter, uh, certainly at our, our December meeting. Thank you. Next question is uh, for Annette Weisbach uh, of CNBC. Annette, please, for you. Thank you very much for taking my question. Uh, President Lagarde, I have two. <clears throat> One is, um, if you read through analyst notes, some are a lot less optimistic about 2022 in terms of economic growth. So what makes you so optimistic? Um, for 2022. And then also a second question is whether you have uh, ever addressed the risk of a stagflationary environment for the Eurozone, given that um, inflation, as you also say, could be more persistent or price pressure could be more persistent. Thank you very much. Well, on on, the, on your first question about uh, how confident we are, uh, I observe that since the beginning of the year, we have regularly upgraded our forecast. And if anything, we might have been on the uh, too pessimistic side uh, to begin with. Um, and what I look at more, more so than uh, uh, analysts' notes, which I'm attentive to, of course, is the projections that are produced by staff, uh, how they um, compare with pro you know, projections that are produced by other international institutions, such as the IMF, the OECD, 
uh, and, and other similar institutions. And uh, we believe that, uh, you know, the economy is going to continue to benefit from uh, further unwinding of containment measures uh, during the second half of 21 into 22 as well. Uh, we also make the assumption that bottlenecks will be uh, circumvented uh, by the economic operators in the, uh, in the first half of 22. Uh, we believe that we will be back to the uh, pre-pandemic 2019 uh, level at the end of this year, which is two quarters uh, earlier than we had uh, initially anticipated. And uh, while we still have uh, a lot of slack, uh, both in production and in unemployment, we are also seeing that slack being, being resolved and reduced uh, more rapidly than we had anticipated. So that gives us good, uh, good reasons to believe that 22 is going to be another uh, good solid year. We have not upgraded our forecast for 22. We still are at plus 4.6%. Uh, in, in, our, in our forecast. And, you know, our risk assessment, as I mentioned earlier, uh, are broadly balanced. Um, you know, clearly, if uh, the pandemic is, is resolved faster because of even further vaccination coverage, the booster uh, is adopted by, by many, uh, that, that is going to be a, an add-on. If more savings are being um, uh, can, used by consumers that will also support consumption, which has been one of the, the, the big drivers of the recovery uh, so far. There's still that you know, chunk of saving that was accumulated over the uh, pandemic period, which has not been tapped into, which might be tapped into. So that's for the upside side of our uh, broadly balanced uh, risk assessment. On the downside, uh, clearly we could have a massive a uh, fourth um, wave or other variants coming to the fore for which vaccinations doesn't work. I mean, you, you have all these possibilities as well. And the supply bottlenecks, which, as I said, we anticipate will be circumvented in the first half of 22, which could last longer and which would have a um, side effect on, on inflation and you know, putting uh, uh, pressure up. And, uh, and which would weigh on the, uh, on the G GDP on the, uh, on the other hand. I think you had a second one which had to do with stagflation. You know, our primary mandate is price stability, but we are also uh, keen to see an economy that recovers fully. And for that to happen, of course, uh, you know, jobs have to be uh, created and the uh, furlough schemes that are in place that retains employees in their position but not in, in actual employment uh, needs to be pursued. And those um, you know, 2 million people still more than in 2019 that are unemployed have to also return to employment. So if that is, if that is the uh, ultimate response of this recovery, then I don't think that we will be heading towards stag stagflation. Thank you. Next question goes to Martin Arnold of the Financial Times. Martin, please. Martin, Hello. I... Hello. Madame Lagarde, can you hear me? Thank yes, you for indeed. taking my question. So I have two questions. Uh, first one is that your chief economist, Philip Lane, said recently that... Um, the amount of assets you purchase after PEP finishes will depend on the amount of debt issued by governments. Do you agree? And my second question is about the link between the ending of asset purchases at the ECB and the first interest rate rise. Uh, at the moment, there's a close link in your guidance between asset purchases ending and soon after that, interest rates rising. Um, do you think that there should be potentially more of a gap or more flexibility on that? Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Martin, for this question. It gives me a chance to actually uh, just repeat yet again, because I think it's, it's an important um, consequences of our last July uh, meeting, uh, the, the, the three criteria that are applicable for our forward guidance on interest rates. And that forward guidance, as you know, has been uh, modified and or clarified to a great extent by including three criteria. One is um, 
we need to see um, inflation outlook at target, that is at 2%, uh, well ahead of the end of our horizon, Sec first criteria. Second, we need to see it through also to the end of the projection uh, horizon. And second, we need to have sufficient elements and indication of progress in the underlying inflation uh, criteria uh, as at the time when we make the decision. So you have these three criteria, and you have the other element of our forward guidance uh, that remain intact and which uh, actually play a role in signaling to markets uh, when, uh, you know, wh what will be the sequence of events from asset purchase uh, to, um, to interest rate uh, hiking. I think we are pretty far away from that, and uh, it also gives me a chance to remind all of us that PEP is a very specific program intended for the pandemic. Uh, it has an emergency character to it. And when you know, that uh, PEP comes to its term, then clearly we have all the other instruments uh, available. And in terms of purchases, we clearly have the asset purchase program, the APP, which we have on a standing basis uh, ever since um, October 2019. And that clearly is intended uh, to, uh, to be continued and will be debated, uh, as I said, at our December meeting. So it's entirely premature to evoke it, and it has not been discussed on the occasion of this meeting. Now, the, um, clearly, when we determine our pace of purchase, we are attentive to the entire universe of bonds. Uh, we are not paying special attention to the fiscal commitment of one country or the other or the uh, bond issuance of one country or the other. So we look at the entire universe of bonds uh, that are available, will be available, are being announced, and, and that's how we determine uh, where our uh, purchase uh, pace is going to be applied. But we, we, we do so, as I said, based on two things under our joint assessment. One is the favorable financing conditions. The second is the inflation outlook. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question goes to Andres Stumpf of uh, the Spanish Daily Expansion. Andres, please. Hello, good afternoon. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, I, I have two questions. So, uh, you said that the need of uh, a PEP recalibration was unanimous. Uh, I would like to know if it was also unanimous, the, the pace uh, decided. And the second question is, uh, after the operation later this month, there would be um, the, the only chance, the final chance, there will be only a chance for the banks to borrow money at the long-term terminals and the TLTRO next December. I, I was wondering if the ECB has taken any decision on this regard and if there will be any long-term funding operations uh, for, for the banks, any more operations, I mean. On, on your, your question about uh, the decision that we made today, um, as I said, it was a unanimous decision uh, in all respects. So the pace, uh, of calibration was, was agreed. The uh, moderately lower uh, determination was agreed unanimously. It was, it was all unanimous. Um, so I'm sorry for those who like to oppose the doves and the hawks. Sorry. For this, for this time, there's not much uh, that you can actually draw from uh, dissenting votes because we all agreed. TLTROs, you're right. Uh, there will be one more uh, operation in December. And um, we will clearly have to uh, discuss what comes next on the basis of the situation uh, at the time. And I think that that will be part of the overall re-examination that we conduct uh, at the time of uh, our December meeting. Uh, this will be, as usual, data dependent. And uh, what, we, what, we, what we have seen based on the bank lending survey, based on the discussions that we've had with representatives of the banking sector is that Teltro's, operate, Teltro's uh, certainly the earlier ones, more so than the, uh, the most recent one, have been critically important to help them and encourage them uh, to provide lending to the economy, which they have consistently done uh, over the course of the last two years. 
Thank you. Thank you. And the next question goes to Ilya Siakantaris uh, of the Greek TV station ERT, please. Yes, please. Yes, can you hear me now? We can hear you from Greece. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Madam President, with the winding down of uh, PEP, a degree of flexibility the ECB has introduced into state bond buying will uh, go away. This is particularly important for Greek bonds, as uh, they are not yet in investment grade. Is the governing council thinks? Uh, does the governing council think that it should be preemptive, clearing out this uncertainty, this lack of flexibility in respect with Greek bonds, and avert unnecessary speculation? Thank you very much. Well, I think it is, it's really uh, too early and unnecessarily at this stage uh, to discuss you know, longer-term issues related to PEP and, uh, and uh, the term of PEP. As I said, it will be discussed at length. We, we will enter into a process of uh, technical review, uh, in-depth uh, analysis of the situation, and, uh, and certainly the situation of Greece will be uh, taken into account and, uh, and addressed specifically. But I think it's premature for the moment. Uh, to do so. Thank you. And the next question will then be for Francesco Canepa of Reuters. Francesco, please. Good afternoon. The first question is about inflation, which um, was 3% according to a flash estimate. Do you think the balance of risk for inflation has shifted and is now to the upside? And how was this reflected by the discussion of the governing council? And the second question is about um, the fact that many of your colleagues, including Mr. De Guinda standing next to you, have signed letters uh, urging the Commission to implement fully and swiftly the Basel III rules for banks. Um, your um, name was conspicuous by its absence. Um, do you support? their call and including its timing, crucially, because um, the governor of the Bank of France said the timing of the letter was unfortunate. So I'm keen to hear your view on that. Thank you. Well, do not worry, Mr. Kanipa. Uh, there is nothing inconspicuous about my name not being on the letter, because all those matters are addressed by my colleague and friend, Andrea Enria, who is, as you know, the head of the SSM. He's the one who has... Uh, full authority and, uh, and much deeper understanding of those issues than I do. But I'm, I'm not uninterested in, in Basel III, uh, and I've had my share of Basel III discussions when I was finance minister and when I was then managing director of the IMF. So I do follow these things, and I do believe that uh, there should be a proper uh, compliance and uh, respect of the timetable in relation to uh, these Basel III uh, issues. But I will turn to my colleague and friends, uh, the Vice President, who is also uh, very, very uh, close to that. I will address your you, you first issue by quoting, uh, because it's, we discussed this sentence uh, to make sure that we were all unanimously in agreement with that in relation to uh, inflation. And we say very clearly in the risk assessment paragraph, if supply bottlenecks last longer, and feed through into higher than anticipated wage, wage rises, price pressures could be more persistent. I don't think we could be more clear uh, than this sentence is. Now, with respect to the letter, you know, I have nothing, I have not much to add to, to what you have said, President. Well, the letter was signed by, by the head of the EBA, by Andrea and Ria, and by myself as uh, person responsible for financial stability. In, in the ECB, and uh, you know, it's crystal clear. The message is crystal clear. Uh, we want uh, full implementation of the Basel III, and I think that uh, you know that's the position of the of the three of us, of the three institutions. And as I have said before, uh, we believe that uh, uh, this full implementation, this rapid implementation, will bring uh, a lot of benefits uh, for the banks and for the economy. Thank you. And the next question goes to Johanna Treg from Politico Europe. Johanna, please. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much for taking my question. President Lagarde, um, so when you discuss PEP in December, um, 
will and the economy will have returned the economic output will have returned to pre-crisis levels will that then be a sufficient condition for you to declare the crisis phase over um and then what should we all expect from november what are you going to do during your november meeting what will we do we do with what between November meeting, given that you are putting so much emphasis on December and um, I think suggesting it's actually, it's that would I think it's actually October. Oh, sorry. October. Um, well, we will all get together around the table and we will assess the, uh, uh, the situation because not a single monetary policy a governing council meeting goes without us looking at the situation, assessing the financing conditions and, and being attentive to the effectiveness of our measures. So uh, don't worry, I'm sure we'll have plenty to discuss and to, and to, and to, um, to review. But as I said, the important uh, meeting at which we will discuss the terms and conditions of the, of the PEP when it comes to its, uh, to its term will be, uh, will be in December. Um, you know, at our December meeting, uh, there will be um, two things. One is, it could well be that our forecast uh, is actually delivered upon. So we have caught up uh, with the, uh, the two years and we are back to uh, pre-pandemic 2019 situation, which doesn't mean that we are back to trend uh, of uh, the, the growth trend that we had in 2019. We, we are still far away from that uh, in our forecast. Uh, and we will have new projections which will give us a projection not for 2023, but for 2024. So we will have more substance to chew on uh, in order to, uh, to discuss the terms and conditions of the, uh, the PEP uh, term. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the next question goes to Francesco Ninfole of uh, Milano Finanza. Francesco, please. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to ask two questions to President Lagarde. Uh, the first, uh, uh, do you fear any kind of contagion from the US in the bond market? And in that sense, uh, will the Fed's decisions on tapering influence your actions? And the second question about uh, uh, fiscal policies. Uh, in your opinion, uh, uh, how should fiscal policies be in the coming months? more focused on fiscal consolidation than in the past, or still on supporting economies in an uncertain phase? Thank you. Mm. Well, thank you for your questions. Um, I would preface my answer to your second question with acknowledging that um, during this crisis, fiscal policy, monetary policy have been reinforcing each other unlike in previous uh, situation. And the fiscal support that has been extended to all the euro area economies uh, has been critically important. And it has been uh, increased relative to our initial projections. If we look back at you know, what we forecasted uh, in December last year and what has so far been the, the fiscal uh, impulse and the fiscal stimulus uh, given to the economies, there is a significant difference. It has, it has actually, it was more than doubled. So fiscal um, policies have been uh, very important and have supported monetary policy as I think we have also complemented. So they, they really worked hand in hand. Our assessment is that um, the fiscal support has to be continued. And as I said in, on, on previous occasions recently, it is no longer the, the massive um, uh, necessary support just across the board to all actors of the economy, uh, as, as was the case in the beginning of the crisis. It needs to be more targeted, it needs to be more surgical, it needs to be associated with the structural reforms that are so much uh, called for and necessary in some countries. And this is really the point about the uh, um, recovery and resilience uh, plans and, and the funding that is made available to that, to that effect. That is underway, will continue to be applied in the, in the uh, quarters and years to come in consideration for delivery under the plans, as you know. And, and we hope that it will facilitate the recovery and it will reduce the risk of divergence between countries and the risk of fragmentation in the recovery process. So 
A time will come, of course, when uh, this fiscal support will have to be uh, gradually withdrawn and where uh, the rules that the Europeans will give to themselves once they have renegotiated uh, the uh, growth and stability pact or whatever they call uh, this, uh, the, the terms under which they operate, uh, that time will come. But it is still premature and we believe that a lot of the good results that we are seeing for the economy and good um, reason for the recovery has to do also with monetary policy, of course, and we should take full credit for that, and fiscal policies. And, and this has to be continued because we are much advanced in the process. Recovery has uh, progressed, uh, is rebounding, but we're not there yet. We're not out of the wood. We are not on the green, as the golf players will appreciate. We're getting closer, but we're not there yet. Thank you. Next question goes to Luke Hayton of Market News International. Luke, please, over to you. Good afternoon, President Lagarde. Um, two questions, uh, if I may. The first was uh, whether the Governing Council has discussed the possible impacts a change of government in Germany might have for the ECB's monetary policy. Uh, and the second was uh, five year, five year forward inflation break evens are at their highest since 2017 but more than 50 basis points since the beginning of the year, uh, way more than the shift in inflation break-evens in the US. How much does such a shift affect your perception of the ECB policy path going forward? Thank you so much. Uh, the answer to your first question is simple and straightforward. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, we had plenty to discuss and we did not um, have any <clears throat> discuss discussion on, on any change uh, of government in any of the euro area countries, I can assure you. The uh, five-year, five-year, 1.75% um, uh, number, which, as you noted, is uh, 50 basis points higher than uh, what, what it was, which is at the highest in a long time, is something that we pay attention to. But it's not the only one. We look at all uh, the, uh, the, 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 the forecast, the uh, market survey, the analyst survey, the forecasters' um, um, numbers. We, we look at all of that. And we also look at what other institutions are producing because we don't want to be um, data um, uh, slave. We are data dependent uh, on in, in, our, in our policy determination. But we want to have a look at a whole range of such data uh, to make sure that it's not only directionally in the same uh, uh, the same vein, but that it's also consistent. And, and we, we, look, we do look at the five-year, five-year, but it's not the only one I can show you. Thank you. And today's last question goes to David McHugh of the Associated Press AP. David, over to you. Thank you. Dave, can you hear us? There seems to be a connection issue. So then the last question goes to Victor Mendes, Barriera of Central Banking. Victor, please. Uh, hi, good afternoon, President Lagarde. Um, my first question is in regards to the self-imposed limits that the ECB has on its monetary policy and asset, asset purchase programs, especially, obviously, the APP. Um, it's true that um, so ECB sovereign bond holding is having conversion towards the capital key, but um, if the APP is to be increased, which seems likely once the PEP expires, um, the ECB holdings would be getting closer to the issuer limit, to the 33% limit on, on the outstanding debt of individual sovereign countries. Uh, do you deem necessary to increase the issuer limit in order to make ECB QE programs sustainable within ECB, within ECB rules? And the second question is, uh, whether you have any update on the impact the pandemic is having on the weaker or highly indebted Southern European countries that are more reliant on ECB support, such as Italy and Spain? Thank you. Well, on, on your first question, thank you very much. But those are issues that will be debated uh, in December. So it's, uh, it's not a matter for me to debate uh, the... Uh, 
the exact limits um, in any shape or form or the uh, capital keys. All I know is that we have uh, a mandate, we have an objective, uh, we have a target which is uh, to be reached and uh, we will have to use all the instruments that we have available and, uh, and we will decide on you know, what terms and conditions uh, will apply at, uh, at our next meeting and we will adjust uh, accordingly if necessary. On, the, um, on your other point, you know, what I observe is that those nations that were most uh, affected by the pandemic, um, which are largely uh, countries from uh, the south of Europe, are the ones that are benefiting from the highest uh, volumes of loans and, uh, and grants under the next generation EU. And we very much hope that uh, with the plans that they have submitted, which have been approved, uh, with the loans and the grants that are uh, already uh, being disbursed and will continue to be so if there is uh, delivery in consideration, then they will be in a much better position to uh, respond to the, uh, to the damage that was suffered. What we can observe, though, is that in relation to tourism, in relation to hospitality services, there has been a significant increase in activity and probably more so than was expected uh, earlier in our projections. Thank you very much. Thank you. This concludes uh, today's press conference. If you want, we will see each other back uh, on 28 October when the next governing council plus press conference takes place. Until then, wish you all the best, goodbye and have a good afternoon. <laughs>